Welcome to the Mobile Money Leadership Forum at the GSMA M360 Africa. My name is Nathan Naidu. I am the acting head of the GSMA Mobile Money Program, and it's a real pleasure to be with all of you here today in Kigali. We have a fantastic program lined up for you over the next few hours. But before we get into it, I want to acknowledge some special guests that we have in the audience. So some of you will know that over the past weekend, we hosted a hackathon right here in Kigali, where developers from across the region competed to see who could put together the most innovative solution integrating with the mobile money services of Airtel Tigo and MTN Rwanda. You would be amazed by what can be accomplished in just two days. And I was struck by how the story of connecting bright young local talent with the scale and commercial excellence of the mobile industry is going to be such a central part of the future of the mobile money service. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to De Deputy Governor Dr. Monique Zanzabaganwa for being here to open this important event. The government of Rwanda has made us feel truly welcome here in the beautiful city of Kigali, and we really thank you for that. So as Nathan mentioned, we, you know, we come into this event after years of steady growth, and we do convene here at an important inflection point for the industry. As you just heard, each and every day, more than a billion dollars is now being processed via mobile money. And this milestone is truly a testament to the collective efforts of all the stakeholders in this room and those across the mobile ecosystem. So before we dive into the exciting sessions that are ahead of us today, I would just like to take a moment to give a few reflections for you to consider as you uh, converse and deliberate. First, I really do think we need to remind ourselves just how far we've come. And while this is certainly an African story, it is also critically a global story, with mobile financial services improving the lives of citizens in emerging markets around the world. Just 10 years ago, in 2008, the total number of mobile money accounts did not even exceed 14 million. And today, there are almost 700 million accounts across 90 markets, with consistent double-digit growth. And the most recent Global Findex report released by the World Bank showed mobile money to be the leading force for expanding financial inclusion in sub-Saharan Africa, with account ownership nearly doubling over the past three years. And this very much echoes our own GSMA State of the Industry report, which charts the spread of mobile money from its traditional stronghold here in East Africa to a continent-wide phenomenon. Rwanda is only one of 26 countries in Africa that has a national financial inclusion strategy and has set some very ambitious targets towards achieving 80% financial inclusion by 2017 and 90% by 2020, as stated in Rwanda's Vision 2020. Yes, Rwanda has a vision of it becoming a knowledge-led economy, and we are on the move to upgrading ourselves to the middle income status, uh, there has been Vision 2020, and now we are talking of Vision 2050, with even higher targets. And we know that technology is going to be one of the driving uh, forces behind the transformation we are talking about, be it economic, be it social, and also the governance. And in these uh, aspects, mobile is going to be the power in our hands. At the GSMA, we are currently working on a, a new enabling regulatory index for mobile money regulation. Uh, that will be launched in the next few months, but I can tell you now that one of the things we've seen is that in countries where regulations are updated more regularly, you tend to have more enabling regulation. Nathan made it very clear that we were supposed to ask tough questions today, and so now, Let's move into those tough questions. Is there enough money out there to fund this next wave of growth? So just to give you a few facts and figures, as of December 2017, the industry contributed over $2.4 billion in direct revenues, um, which is quite staggering. 
And some of our leading mobile network operators have, are making now about 20% of their top line revenues from mobile money. This year is very particular for Orange because uh, it's the 10th anniversary of Orange Money since we launched in 2008 in Côte d'Ivoire, the first service. Uh, and now we have uh, almost 40 million uh, customers in 17 uh, countries. And we make last year more than 240 million euro revenue, which is more than 5% of the total revenue for Orange in Middle East and, and Africa. We compete with the mobile money operators run by telcos, uh, but we're clearly the leader in, in the country. And then we have the liberty to take risks on the investments that we, we make. We are now very, very creative in, uh, in, in, in using our, um, uh, you know, our, own, our, our own funds to, to support growth. If you're a farmer, um, it's, good, it's good that you are transferring, but then it's also good to be able to have a savings product. It's important to have insurance because that clearly mitigates um, certain, um, sort of, um, certain um, work-related risks over time. It's important to have pensions, it's important to have um, some risk mitigation for those one-off events like healthcare or the death in a family that will take um, a family or a household back into poverty. Africa is huge, right? And the real challenge in Africa is scale. How do you drive um, payments? How do you drive mobile money? How do you drive financial inclusion without requiring the hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars that traditional models would require? And the only way to do that is to have widespread partnerships. So, so great to have you here with us. Um, I mentioned before the break that you are really a significant figure in the mobile money industry, sitting atop the mobile money uh, business of MTN Group, one of the largest mobile money providers in the world. Uh, you've been in your role now for about five years, and during that time, MTN Group has seen a growth in its mobile money business from just a few million accounts to today over 25 million active 30-day mobile money accounts, which is a, a very impressive stat. What we want is to position ourselves as a platform where we become an enabler. So uh, we, we link together um, businesses to our customers, and also we link businesses together. You know, we so. talk about privacy, we talk about trust, and sometimes we confuse the two, and what do we mean? And so, Raul, from Millicom's perspective, as one of the first institutions to go through, voluntarily go through the certification process, what do you see as the relationship between privacy and trust? And how has the certification allowed you as an institution to embody what it needs to do to further that in, for the customer experience? Um, as Millicom, um, we serve around 24 million customers around Africa through our Tigo and Santal brands and through our JV with Airtel in, in Ghana. Uh, as, a, as a mobile operator in the region, uh, trust and privacy is also something that has been in our agenda for a long time. We have a, a, a global data protection privacy that we have across our operations in Latin America and Africa. Uh, we uh, entered into the GSMA code of conduct for mobile money in 2014. And uh, recently, we just uh, finished our, our GSMA uh, certification for mobile money. So it's, it's in the heart of what we do. Uh, however, we see trust a bit bigger than just price. Uh, and to summarize it, I think we see it in two, two ways. Trust is trust that you earn by your own actions and how you operate. And it's also trust that you earn by your reputation and who you associate with. Uh, in terms of who, uh, who do we associate with, uh, you know, we've uh, recently launched you know, quite successful uh, partnerships with the likes of MasterCard, which is worldwide renowned. Uh, we've uh, launched partnerships with Uber, which is also a worldwide renowned uh, tech company. And we're uh, about to launch uh, payments through, through Google Play, through, through our App Store. So that's one way of customers saying, and the other one is by word of mouth, what other customers experience. 
think we think about trust on two levels uh, and when it comes to designing our services. So one is how to engender trust in the end user. And as a network of networks, uh, our clients are the mobile networks and the merchants, money transfer operators, and banks that we connect those mobile networks to. So as, someone, as, a, as, a, as a platform that doesn't f face the customer directly, we have to design a service that can be adapted by our, client, our partners to meet their end users where they are so that they deliver a service that's reliable, that's familiar, and that's consistent in a way that engenders trust for the end user. Um, and the second area, which probably takes up much more of our focus, um, is the... Uh, is in, is promoting trust among our partners. Um, and, and we think of it in terms of s trust as a service. So when we connect money transfer operators ac across the globe to mobile network operators in Africa, uh, those partners trust us to connect only licensed, regulated uh, partners who have the required approvals to do the services that they operate in their jurisdictions. We work with... Uh multiple organizations and governments, and uh, we make sure that if there's money to be transferred and uh, they need to make sure that the person is 100% the person that should receive the money, she or he will be that person. And this is why we work with the World Food Program and UNHCR and governments regarding uh, uh, beneficiaries for government aid. Serene was mentioning converting mobile money into platforms, and this is, I think, the next wave of uh, once you, you have uh, mo mobile money, not only person to person within the country, but also becomes a holistic mobile money across country, and you, ne you need to be compliant with everything. This is where I think our technology comes in, and this is where we have the trust of big organizations like the UN who ensure when one out of 40 million or 50 million people, this person is who he says, and thus I can safely uh, transfer the money with them. Um, in 2015, we had a bank-led model, which was to expect the banks to invest in a mobile money agency network. However, we realized that it wasn't working, so we moved towards telco led. And we came out with electronic money issuers guideline, which clearly define what operators need to do to engender consumers' trust. We also ensure that uh, our, our operators are conscious of cyber security because consumers don't want to uh, see their money vanish from their phones. You know, the regulator's role is not to ensure value, it's to ensure reliability and safety. And with that basis, you guys can compete, right, and add further value. So I think, you know, it makes for a very dynamic um, environment, and I think we've got a useful grounding. I think what's exciting now, when we see uh, an increase in penetration of smartphones on the consumer side, but we also see a massive investment around fintech and financial technology in general. Aadhaar, or India's unique ID, uh, is a digital identity that is issued to anybody living in uh, the country for more than 182 days. Anybody can be enrolled in the program by uh, sharing their biometric and their demographic details. Close to 1.21 billion IDs that have been issued by the Unique Identity Authority of India. And as of last year, uh, we had about 600 million IDs linked to bank accounts. So all of these 600 million unique IDs can work as financial addresses. You just need to quote your Aadhaar number and the Aadhaar-enabled payment system uh, maintained by uh, the National Payments Corporation ensures that money uh, goes through. We've been doing this for years now with um, things like APIs and USSD designs and um, smartphone apps and things like this. And as we've uh, matured and grown forward, we see opportunities for things like blockchain, Internet of Things, um, artificial intelligence. But as we start to move more towards this frontier of technology, one issue is that these are admittedly buzzwords. And so we want to make a concerted effort to make a distinction between what is the expectation and what is practical right now and how do we get from you know, right now to the future. Something that we're, we're, we're constantly doing is listening to the customer, listening to the problems. You know, liquidity management was something that we heard was a problem uh, years ago. You know, a consumer looking for, where do I cash out? 
I think it's also very important to understand the size of the last mile. We are talking about 1.7 billion adult people in the world that do not have access to financial services. Today we have all the ingredients for facilitating mobile money financial services in Rwanda. Among the ingredients that I'll look at is the infrastructure, where I look at uh, the platform is available, stable. We have strategic partners, whether it existing probably banks, service providers. Then the other ingredient that we probably have, which, which is uh, also key, is having a, a large footprint of agents. Um, our solutions, our focus areas are in agriculture, health, education, uh, utilities, but we have been quite impressed in some of the things that we're doing are starting to cross those boundaries. When the kid develops uh, sustainable, innovative uh, software solutions to, for utilities and uh, basically to bring out good governance, accountability and transparency in public service institutions, uh, we won a water hackathon at the IHUB in Nairobi and we got the opportunity to scale our, our solution. It was funded by the World Bank. I think when we're talking about the last mile and really focusing on the last mile, you know, it's, it is important to celebrate the success. One billion dollars a day going through the system, 680 million uh, users now, and that is noteworthy and wonderful and we should celebrate it, but I think also have some humility uh, and think about some of the other big numbers that we're facing too, the 1.7 billion that are still completely excluded uh, globally. Uh, it, we have a gender gap of 9% um, and that has persisted, that is not, as numbers have gone up for financial inclusion, that gender gap has not closed uh, and that is a, a big challenge and if you start to really look at usage rates, I mean this is just access, those who have the account, if those who are using those accounts globally, you know, if we start to actually look at those numbers, uh, the picture looks a little more stark or perhaps the opportunity looks a little bit uh, brighter uh, for us to move forward depending on how you look at it. So when uh, mobile money was introduced in Rwanda, so most of, most of the products and services were, that were rolling out were in-house, in-house built, all uh, addressing uh, issues that were identified in-house. But as, uh, as we evolve, certainly there is, uh, there is need for us to upscale and we cannot upscale alone. Okay. So meaning that we need to get into strategic partnerships where we need to give an opportunity to solution developers. Whenever we are in a, in a hotel, even here yesterday we had a, a meal and everybody's saying, how much do you owe me? Can you just send me and pay Do you have a PayPal account? And then I'll, I'll run my card. And if it's a corporate card, we have to split the bill and have to justify every single bit of it. How do you bring all these conversations into, into, into in, in all these transactions and conversations into a single platform? That is an emerging trend across the world. It is not a Safaricom thing. It is not uh, an Amazon thing. It's, it's an and everybody thing, and you're looking at these things happening, and you're saying, "What is my data telling thing, telling me? Is it something I'm imagining, or is this data telling me?" And we looked at our data, and it, we, we actually observed that for every M-Pesa transactions, there's a conversation that is that happens around it. Yeah,